If you want to talk about a, a, a Christian that had a very difficult life, uh, uh, full of uh, all kinds of opposition and hostility, that would be King David. Uh, if you go through his life and study, because he wrote many of the Psalms, as we know, and many of them are um, imprecatory prayers where he prays for God to deal with his enemies, where he lays out his heart uh, as a politician and as a king of the obstacles that he faced uh, as, as a Christian man leading a, a, a nation. Um, and you don't have to search far to look at all the stories of the things that he faced. Uh, at the very beginning uh, of his being chosen to be the king, uh, we all know that God took the first king, Saul, and dethroned him. Uh, and as with most, most politicians who love their power, uh, Saul did not go quietly into the night, as we know. So uh, when it found out that uh, Samuel had now anointed David, the young David, the shepherd, uh, nobody from Bethlehem as the king to replace him, uh, Saul made uh, David's life miserable. And so he hunted him down. And uh, 1 Samuel 19, uh, he sends out his troops to go to try to eliminate uh, David. Uh, in in uh, 1 Samuel 21, he actually uh, tracks him down with his troops uh, down in the En Gedi desert re region of the Dead Sea. I've been down there many times with people, all the different caves where David had to hide. I mean, he hunted him down like a dog and he was God's chosen man. Could you imagine that God personally chose you to do a mission for him and then it didn't turn out to be a simple mission. It turned out to be a difficult mission. And so David could at any point when you study his life in 1 Samuel could have said, God, I, I don't think I want this assignment. Uh, this duty station is not what I thought. Uh, could I do something else? But he didn't. Uh, he stayed the course and he did the difficult thing. Uh, he, he led a godly life in what I would call hostile times. Uh, but it wasn't just Saul was his problem. Uh, later when he became king, uh, we know that his son Absalom, he had, David had all kinds of dysfunction in his family. Not that you can relate at all. There's no dysfunction in our church whatsoever. Yeah, you probably saw it at Christmas when you got together with family members, you know. you reminded of the dysfunction. David had all kinds of family dysfunction. Uh, his son Absalom uh, destroyed the family because he seized power from his father. Uh, he, he declared he was a good-looking guy, had a full head of hair. Uh, in fact, the script, scriptures wax eloquent about Absalom's hair, just how beautiful it was, how thick it was, etc. Uh, and all, everybody loved Absalom. So he, he de gets declared king by his own personal power. Uh, that split the kingdom in two. Uh, eventually, uh, thousands of Israelites died in the internal warfare. David eventually reclaimed the throne, but he also lost a son physically uh, because of the, uh, the combat. That was his life, and, and, that, and, and, and that was just within the nation. Uh, he had all kinds of external in his enemies. Uh, Second Samuel uh, chapter five tells us that the Philistines caused him great grief uh, on his southern border. Uh, he fought, according to Second Samuel eight and chapter 10, the, the Ammonites uh, had issues with them. And then to the north on his northern border, he fought the Syrians. So you can imagine internal struggles as a national leader, internal struggles within your family, and then you're surrounded by enemies on all points of the compass who want to get rid of you. And God called you to this job. So you, when you became a Christian, you be, it's so that life could be easy, correct? Well, not really, no. When you become a Christian, uh, usually things get more difficult as God begins to test your mettle. And so when you look at David, he had a choice. I'm going to either be a godly man in a hostile environment or I'm going to implode like the, the, the typical lawn chair and not be a great saint. We know what he chose to do. He chose to be a great godly man at a very hostile time. So maybe you can relate. As you look at uh, 2021, all that transpired in your life uh, personally and maybe at your job, uh, and you're looking forward to the new year, uh, what kind of man or a woman of God are you going to be? So I would say uh, be David in Psalm 141. Uh, here we find in Psalm 141, he's going to answer this question in, in a sevenfold format. I'm sorry, this is not a three-point sermon. This is a seven-point sermon. It is possible to do seven points in one sermon. Um, he's gonna answer the question of how do you achieve maturity amidst hostility? I mean, how do you remain a godly person when there's dysfunction in your family, uh, angst in your family, among your family members, there's, there's problems between you and people at work, your job uh, is, is difficult. What, what do you, how do you become a Christian that is really making a mark for God in that kind of environment? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, Paul sets the uh, kind of the groundwork of, of cr the Christian life because uh, this is uh, his, his last letter, as it were. He's writing uh, to young Pastor Timothy, and he's giving him the pastoral ropes. And here's what he says to young Pastor Timothy. He says, but you followed my teaching, uh, my conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, uh, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch 
at Iconium and Lister, where they stoned Paul for his faith. Uh, what persecutions I endured, and out of all of them, the Lord delivered me. Because that's how God works. He helps you in the middle of those difficulties. He said, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will have an amazing, easy life. Don't you wish you could write the scripture? What, what did he say there? All. All means everybody. Everybody. All Christians who desire to live a godly life will be pers persecuted. Uh, positive message for the new year. Don't you feel the love? Um, but he says in verse 13, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, uh, as a pastor, he says, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then is that famous text of all scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for what? Reproof, correction, training in righteousness. Why? Well, the purpose clause in verse 17 says that the man of God or the woman of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work or are ready to do ministry for God or ready to live for God. So what do you need to do in hostile times? Stay in the word of God, right? And apply it to your life. That's exactly what David, that's what David did. And I'm just gonna tell you as your pastor, well, that's, that's my commitment. That no matter what happens in said culture, no matter how hostile said culture becomes, my divine obligation is to study the scriptures, know the scriptures, teach the scriptures, and allow them to be used for reproof, correction in my own life and in your life to train us all in the ways of righteousness so that we can be equipped to do God's work. See, that is exactly what we're called to do. And that is what David did. So with that in mind, uh, let's pay attention to this. How many points was this sermon? Now I'm on medication, so who knows what's gonna come out during this sermon. So just saying, I got my bottle, bottle of water ready, so I'm ready. So uh, seven things that he covers here of how he functioned in hostile times. The uh, things that he learned in his life as he looks back over them and says, wow, you know, what have I learned? Uh, so here's what he says that you need to do. Number one, if you wanna function well in hostile times, you need to get into prayer. You need to be a praying person. This is what he says. He says, this is a Psalm of David. Uh, that particular superscription, as I've told you before, is part of the Hebrew text that's inspired. He says, it's a Psalm of David. And notice what he says. O Lord, I call upon thee, hasten to me. Uh, give ear to my voice when I call to thee. May my prayer be counted as incense before thee, the lifting up of my hands as the evening offering. You can, you can see his utter desperation here. Perhaps you've had a prayer like this on hostile dysfunctional times where you came before the throne of God and you said, God, I don't know what you're doing right now. I know you're super busy with running the cosmos, but listen to me. I have some issues. I have some huge things on my plate. I need your help. Would you listen to me and would you do it quickly? I mean, you, don't leave me in the waiting room because <clears throat> that happens to you sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, now, if God answered all your prayers straight away, what kind of faith would you have? Probably a brutal faith, uh, a weak faith. But he says, you know, God, sometimes... I really, I don't want to get stuck in the drive-thru waiting for you to answer. I need, I need some help now. And so he's, uh, he tells God, uh, I need to, uh, to have my prayer ascend before you, much like the incense altar that goes up before the, the Holy of Holies. May my prayer be like that, the constant aroma of incense uh, going before you. Remember the 60s when we all used incense? You're not going to confess that you did? Uh, yeah, I had many friends when I went over to their house, you could hardly breathe in the bedrooms because of the incense sticks and other smells that were going on. But, but, but the incense in the, in, the, in the temple was, you know, it was that which represented the prayers of the saints. And so he's saying, God, as that incense altar is constantly burning before the Holy of Holies curtain where you are, my, might that be like my prayer, like a sweet smelling savor that goes up before you constantly telling you, I need help, I need help. See, uh, it's easy when you're in a point of difficulty to, to rely upon your own strength, your own, uh, own uh, cognitive abilities, your own problem-solving abilities. That's arrogance. Because God will continue to put the screws on you until you finally kneel before him and say, God, I, I, I need you, and I, I need you to help me straight away. And so that's what David does. He says, in, do in very difficult times, make sure that you are a person that spends much time knocking on heaven's door. Uh, Matthew chapter seven, verses six to seven, Jesus says, uh, when the disciples asked how to pray, uh, he's telling them, you must do three things. You must ask, and you must seek, and you must do what? You know the passage? You must knock. And they're all 
present tense participles denoting perpetual activity. So you don't just go to heaven's door and just knock one time, hey Lord, I need some help. I'm busy, I'll be back later. I'm expecting you to just listen to that one prayer and I'm good. No, he says, no, when, when it's something extremely important to you, you need to show God just how important that is by asking, seeking, and knocking. And God's gonna give you uh, an answer to your prayer because uh, he says he will. Uh, and in Matthew chapter seven, verse nine, he tells you this about his answering of your prayer. He says, what man is there among you when a son will ask him for a loaf, like of bread, uh, will give him a stone? What dad would do that? Your kid comes to you and say, hey dad, I'm really hungry for lunch. You know, Pastor Marty preached an awful long time. Could it, you know, could I, some, could I have some, you know, some bread? Uh, are you gonna turn around and give him a, a, like a, a, a large river rock out of, the, out of the garden? No, what dad would do that? Well, he wouldn't. He says, if there is a son who asks his dad for a fish, he's not gonna give him a snake, will he? Answer, no, who would do that? No, he says, if then, being evil, uh, you, he says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, which you all would agree that you do, especially just after Christmas, right? Um, how much more shall your father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? He says, if you think that, that God's gonna give you something that you, that's detrimental to you, then you have the wrong view of God. And some people have a wrong view of God. They think that God's gonna give me that which is detrimental, which will destroy me, it's gonna be terrible for me, and God says, I, Jesus says, I, I don't act like that. As a father doesn't act that way, I don't act that way. So he says to, to David, I hear you knocking. I hear you asking, I hear you seeking, and I'm gonna answer you. It may not be exactly how you want me to answer, but what I give you will be the best for you. You know, um, as I stopped and pondered uh, my life on Monday after living 64 years on the planet, it would, uh, one must pause and ask for wisdom. But just stopping and thinking early in the morning, like, what, Lord, what have I learned in 64 years? Too much to write about, you know? But one of the things I've learned is when the going gets tough, the tough get into prayer because it's the times I spent before the throne of God where God has reached down from heaven and given me answers in due time that now that I look back that I'm older to say he was so wise in how he answered that. So of the seven things you should do, and then the first one is you should get into what? Prayer, two. <laughs> two is very convicting. It's one of those verses you wish you could skip. You gotta get control of your what? Mouth, oh no, everybody's gonna start, leave. I gotta leave, hey. No, no, you can't leave right now. What does he say? Uh, here's verse three, he says, uh, God, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth, keep watch over the door of my lips. Isn't this interesting? That he's facing opposition, facing hostility, so instead of praying for God to nuke his enemies, he's telling him, God, I've been doing a lot of uh, self-analysis, and I realize that in any given problematic situation, the problem is not with my opposition, the problem is my mouth. Do you have a problem with your mouth? Does your mouth ever say things that afterward you look at it and think, what in the world? I thought I had total control over my mouth. I had thought I totally arrived spiritually. Then all of this stuff came out. Has it ever happened to you? Probably not, but has it happened? You're so quiet now. Yes, it, it's happened to me. It's, it's amazing. Just, the, just when you think you, you're standing, you fall. This little situation, whether it's something happens uh, at a grocery store, somebody cuts in front of you in line, happened to me the other day, I don't like cutters. I tend to want to say something, et cetera. In fact, this, I, I kind of held my tongue the other day, I thought, I'm not gonna say anything, oh, and I'll start a scene or something. And then some, somebody else behind me stepped in and, and told the person that they cut. I'm, thank you, God, for moving in that person's life. Uh, you saved me from my own mouth. But so, I mean, so David knows that in any given situation, he's gonna be tempted to, uh, if you're gonna falsely accuse me, I'm gonna accuse you. Uh, if you are going to say mean things about me, I'm gonna say mean things about you. If you're gonna do ad hominem attacks against me, I'm gonna do ad hominem attacks against you. If you're gonna drop the F-bomb, and I don't know what it is in Hebrew, because I don't know Hebrew cuss words, but whatever the cuss word might have been back then, if you're gonna do that to me, I'm gonna do that to you. Because remember, he's in the military. If anybody knew how to use foul language, I'm just saying, it was him, it was him. So what does he do? He says, Lord, I gotta get real. In any hostile situation, I know I'm tempted to go toe to toe and whatever things they do, I could do it right back at him. But he says, I really need you to help me. <coughs> my problem is my mouth, my mouth. You know, well, it, the problem is really not the mouth. 
Uh, notice what Jesus says, uh, Mark chapter 7. Listen to me, all of you, and understand. I mean, get a clue. Uh, there is nothing outside the man which is going into him that can defile him. Oh, well, how do you get defiled spiritually? It's the things which proceed out of the man which defile the man. Uh, and if any man has ears to hear, let him hear. You need to wake up, Jesus says, and listen to what I'm going to tell you now. Verse 20. And he, 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 and he was saying, that which proceeds out of a man, that is what defiles the man, that which comes out of your mouth. Well, that's part of the problem, but there, there's more to it than that. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, the Greek word pornea, uh, sexual sin, uh, thefts, murders, adulteries, uh, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. I think he pretty much covered everything, didn't he? And he said, all of these evil things pr proceed from within, and they, they defile the man. They come from where? Well, they come from your heart. They come from your head. I mean, have, has this not ever happened to you? You're in a very dysfunctional, hostile time. You've just about had it. You reach your breaking point with somebody at the Pentagon somewhere. It's a pressure cooker situation, and you just had it with that general officer, and boom, out comes all this stuff. And you walk back, and you go, ah, where did all that come from? And, and the Spirit of God's saying, well, that's in your heart. That's in your heart, and it just came out of your mouth. So, you know, David was right. God put a guard over my mouth because a lot of stuff comes out of there that can really defame your name. So could you put like an angel over my mouth just to stop my mouth, you know, when this stuff's gonna come out? Uh, and, and really what he's saying is, God, you gotta help me with my heart. So as you look at living in hostile, dysfunctional times, uh, and we do uh, as we pursue God, because as you pursue God and live a godly life, those who are ungodly around you, they're bothered by your Christianity. So they're going to attack you by definition. So he says, God, uh, help me to be a man of prayer. Number two, help me with my mouth. What would be a great prayer for 2022? God, help me to be a man of prayer, woman of prayer, and help me, help me with my mouth. And, and I totally understand this. I mean, been down that road because I'm a debater kind of personality, kind of a, a analytical arguing kind of personality. I know my propensity. Um, and I know how easily things can come out. And so if you need some help, just turn to Romans 12, 1 and 2 and meditate on the content in Romans 12, 1 and 2 of uh, Paul's mandate there to let your mind be transformed. God, transform my mind, transform my heart so that I can gain control over my mouth. And it doesn't hurt to ask God to help you control what's coming out of your mouth in your dysfunctional marriage. You don't want to be saying things that you're going to be sorry for or to say things in a tough situation that, that are gonna defame the name of Christ. I've done it many times growing up as a, as a Christian. Walked away and thought, what was I thinking? Number three, get control of your desires. Notice he's not focusing any on his opposition. He's focusing on who? Himself. This is how holy he is, how, what a godly man he is. He says, do not, God, do not incline my heart to any evil thing to practice the deeds of wickedness with men who do iniquity and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Wow. He, he says, Lord, I've analyzed myself. I have issues with my mouth. I get it. Help me with that. Uh, and then by the way, he said, I've also done some analysis on myself and I realized that when I'm with certain kinds of people that don't know you, I tend to like what they're doing and I do those things. If you go way back to Psalm 1, remember that if you were here or you all knew? Remember Psalm 1? Read it sometime today. And you, it, it's like the background of this whole point. Because that's like, you know, you don't, you don't walk with the ungodly. You don't, you know, sit down with the ungodly. I mean, all that kind of stuff. Because he's saying, if, if I have a whole bunch of non-Christian people around me and they're doing evil things, you know, some of the evil things look fun. And I tend to kind of like to do them. So he says, God, in addition to helping me be a man of prayer, helping me be a person uh, who um, uh, has control of my mouth, I have problems with my desires because my desires are for evil things. I mean, scripture says stolen water is what? Sweet. I mean, it's sweet at the moment. And so he says, God, help me not to eat the delicacies of the things that, that my friends around me are eating or smoking or drinking or dropping or popping or whatever. Because once you get into those situations, it's easy just to continue and do those things. Like when I played sports in high school, um, as the only Christian at the time on the team, one of my commitments to God was, I won't go to their parties. It drove them crazy. They invited me all the time to go to their parties. I know what they did at their parties. What did they do at parties? They, they drank. 
Are they underage? Do they care? No. They partied hard. I mean, they would get sloppy drunk, all my friends, etc. And I, and I just wouldn't, I wouldn't go because I knew if I went, I'd be tempted to do whatever they're doing just by definition of prayer pressure. And so it's, it's that whole thing. God, help me with my desires not to cave to what they're doing uh, because I don't want that to then compromise my faith. Do you have a problem with desire? Well, then you have to then ask God to help you with your desire. I was thinking about desire, how difficult it is to overcome desires, that which you're drawn to. I was thinking about my, my dad. He smoked for 53 years. I think he started smoking when he was 13. Go figure. Smoked all through the Korean War, smoked all the time he was a federal agent, all the way up until he had his first heart attack. He loved camel cigarettes. No filter. I've picked them up and tried them before. I wouldn't suggest they're, they're wonderful for your life. I tried one once when he flicked it off from listening to do a Dodger game. I went over and picked it up and, you know, as a kid and tried to smoke it. Mm -mm. I almost died right there on the front lawn, you know. And I'm like, why does he desire these things? But he was just driven to smoke these things. Then he had his first heart attack and the surgeon told him, Mr. Baker, the heart medication you're on is the greatest drug to get you off of nicotine that exists. If you're gonna ever break smoking, this desire to smoke, now's the time. And my dad did. After 53 years, he stopped smoking cold turkey. And he had a couple other heart attacks past that, but he never smoked again. But the funny thing was, we could walk by a car who, where someone had been smoking with the windows down, he couldn't, he couldn't stand it. He would start gagging. If he was near anybody, like any, any close proximity to him, he could smell it. He would start getting sick. He could, he'd lost the total desire. And I was thinking about that this week. It's like God took that from him, that desire to do that, and, and healed him of that. And I was thinking, as, what David asked here, God, would you help me with my desire? Don't you think the same God can reach down into your heart with whatever your desires are and say, I can take that from you? Well, then what should your prayer be, God? You know my propensity, that when I'm around those kind of people, I tend to kind of do what they do. Take the desire for me to want to do that away from them. I mean, people, they tell me, they go on business trips around here, they fly all over the country, they go to business trips, you have your business meetings, uh, and then you have dinners, and then, then they go to bars. Because people here tell me, you, you go to the bars. And one of my friends told me, I realized a long time ago when I needed to go home, back to my room. Because he said, bad stuff happens if I hang out late at night with all my people I work with. Because he knew himself as a former Marine, a uh, life he had seen. And that's, that's just David, this godly living. So three things to do to overcome hostility. Number one, be a person of prayer. Number two, control your mouth. Number three, get control of your desires. Next, this is a really interesting one. Get used to sound criticism. <laughs> when I studied this psalm this week, I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. Have you ever prayed for God to send people to your life to criticize you? Who would do that? I'm sitting there at my desk looking at this going, there's no other way to interpret this. This is exactly what he says. Then I had to ask myself, have I ever asked God in my entire Christian walk to send people in my life to criticize me? No. You don't want people coming and criticizing you. And when they do, you let them have it, don't you? Who are you to, you know what I'm talking about? And so listen to what he says here. Verse five. Let the righteous smite me in <laughs> love. Do you see this? Are you awake? Lord, let the righteous smite me in kindness. Okay, how do you want them to smite me? When they reprove me, huh? Are you crazy? He says, when they do this, it's like oil in my head. It's like medicinal oil. You're thinking in your carnality. No, it's not. It destroys me when I get emails like that. Uh, I'm just adding to the text in case you're wondering. <clears throat> Uh, don't let my head refuse it, uh, for still my prayers against their wicked deeds. Yes, Lord, I'm praying against people who are hostile toward me in my Christian walk, yes. But, but, but Lord, help me to be able to differentiate between someone who's critical and wants to destroy me and somebody who's critical who wants to make me a better man of God. Oh, that's totally different. Uh, wouldn't you as a Christian want people to come tell you if you were doing something sinful? Case in point, if you saw me at the grocery store, Someone cuts in front of me, and you know Marty doesn't like cutters, because I, I confessed it to you, didn't I? All right? And you see me, and you see me grab the person in love, pick them up, and because I've done this in high school, and <laughs> move the person, and then use a couple of keywords, just kind of let them know that was not okay for you to do that. You'd be going, whoa, I need to call him. I can't have my pastor doing that at Giant. We'll shop somewhere else. 
I can't have that happen, so what would you need to do? You need to call me, right? Yeah, 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 you would need to call me, tell me, yeah. remember that sermon you preached? Yeah, yeah, remember that whole thing about, you know, your mouth, uh-huh, yeah, and that whole thing about desire, mm-hmm. and criticism, today's the day. Because we, my, we saw you, you can't do that, you can't throw people out of line, etc. cetera. So he's, he's telling you, uh, God, might I be the kind of person that if I, if I go off the rails, because he said I know myself, I'm gonna blow it. When I do, might there be a godly person who comes alongside me and goes, hey David, can, can we talk? Can we talk? Because the person who comes alongside you to criticize you for, about godly things wants the best from you. First uh, Thessalonians chapter five, verse 14. Here's what Paul says. He says, we urge you, brethren, admonish who? The unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. And this is a, we can skip that one. <laughs> You want, to, you want God to answer your prayer today? Just pray that last part. God, help me to be patient with all men in 2022. Yeah, how about the whole thing? Uh, we had, must admonish the really. Part of my job is admonishing the unruly as a, as a pastor. That's part of my job. It's not, it's not pleasant, but it's most necessary. If somebody is going off the spiritual rails, someone has to step in who loves them to tell them, brother, that's sin. You need to come back. And you have the same obligation. Uh, so admonish the unruly. And this is exactly what uh, David is saying. God, send somebody to me when I am unruly who will admonish me. Because admonishment uh, is part of the Christian walk. Just don't be praying, God, give me the gift of criticism and admonishment. Okay, that's a whole other thing. Uh, but don't be afraid to step in when there's sin to say, I need to call you back to that which is holy. James chapter two, uh, James, uh, there's all kinds of illustrations in the scriptures of, of saints admonishing the other saints. Here's an illustration. James, uh, the Lord's brother, uh, chapter two, says this. He says, my brethren, uh, do, not hold faith your, uh, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of what? Personal favoritism. For if a man uh, comes into your assembly with a gold ring and, and dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay a special attention to the one who's wearing the fine clothes, and you say, you sit here in this really nice chair, this good place. Uh, and you say to the poor man, well, you, you can stand over there uh, and, and sit down at my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourself and become judges with evil motives? Answer, yes. What's James say? You can't, as a Christian, show favoritism. God doesn't. He's no respecter of persons. So it doesn't matter if the person's worth $10 million or is $10 in, in, their, in their pocket. If they're a believer in Christ, they're a brother or sister in Christ, you cannot show favoritism. What were they doing in that church? Showing favoritism? We have a whole section for the major donors right here. I, no, I'm not saying that's you, but it could, could be, but let's just pretend. They, they, we just know they sit there, you know. No, 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 no. No, he says, don't do that. Now, it, it was risky for James to do this because once you confront the person, because uh, I've, I've done it before, been there, done that, you confront them over something that's sinful, they can blow up, they can get angry, they can cuss you out, they can make your life miserable, they can spread stories around you to d- destroy you so you don't have to deal with them. I've seen all of these things. So it's risky for uh, a, a Christian to step forward to admonish, but James says it's worth it. Why? Because the intimacy with Christ is at stake and the unity of the church is at stake. Uh, so David says, Lord, help me to be the kind of Christian that I'm not so high and mighty that Someone can't come to me and say, brother, could we talk? I had a friend of mine that I'd known since we were five. He attended my last church. And so we played sports together since we were five. Pee Wee League, Little League, Babe Ruth League, Pony League, freshman baseball, junior varsity baseball, varsity baseball. James and I were tight. We still talk. And uh, he came into me one time after a Bible study. He said, hey, uh, could I come by and talk to you tomorrow? I'm like, well, you work in Frisco. You're two hours from me. Why do you need to talk to me for? He goes, we need to talk. If your best friend tells you you need to talk, you probably need to talk, right? So I said, well, what do you want to do? Let's go out to the driving range. Okay, cool. So we went out there, and so we were, you know, it was a Thursday afternoon. We were at the driving range because Bible study was on Wednesday. And I said, hey, James, what's up with you? I mean, I've known you all, all my life. They're like, what is up with you? He goes, you're up with me. I'm like, oh. Like, well, what's the matter? He goes, um, well, you, you uh, you, you, you embarrassed me last night. I, I embarrassed you? And he goes, yeah, I'm in Bible study. He said, when we were asking questions, I said, I raised and asked the question, uh, and you made a joke out of my statement, so everybody laughed at it because it was super funny what you said, but then it made me feel devalued 
by asking a question. And that hurt my feelings. I go, I've known you since we were five. And you know, I, I like to joke around. I hurt your feelings. And here's this big guy. He's like two of me. He's a huge guy. And he, he's like, he's got his little golf club. You know, he's like, yeah, you, you hurt my feelings. I could have looked at him and said, hey, you need to get over it, dude. But since he's larger than I am and he has a, has a golf club, <laughs> I'm like, you know, James, if, if I did that and I did it, I, I remember doing that because I do do that sometimes and people laugh and it's funny. But if I did it at your expense, then it wasn't worth my friendship. So I take the admonishment. I never did that again. I never did that again. And so that admonishment is kind of what David's saying. God, help me when I blow it to have somebody comes alongside me to tell me, hey, you need to come back over here. See, that's how you live in hostile times. You live so close to God that you're listening to other godly people to stay close to God. Next, get pleasant with the unpleasant, verses six to seven. Get pleasant with the unpleasant. He says, their judges, the wicked, are thrown down by the sides of the rock and they hear my, they hear my words for they are pleasant. As when one plows and breaks open the earth, our bones have been scattered at the mouth of Sheol. <laughs> okay, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being extremely difficult to interpret, one piece of cake, where would you place this one? I'm gonna tell you, it's past 10. So, cause I've read the commentaries of the Old Testament scholars. Uh, there's one uh, Old Testament scholar, uh, his name is Perown, who says concerning verse six, quote, um, he says, this verse, difficult in and of itself, is still more difficult because it has no very obvious connection either with, the, with what precedes it or with what follows it. He says, the illusions are so obscure that it's impossible to do more than guess at its meaning. This guy's got a PhD in Hebrew. He looks at this verse and goes, I don't even have an idea what it's talking about. So I had to look at this and go, okay, God, what are you talking about? I mean, what are you talking about? Uh, let's read it again. Their judges are thrown by, down by the sides of the rock. They hear my words for they are pleasant. It's like as when one plows and breaks open the earth. Our bones have been scattered at the mouth of Sheol. And I will tell you, there's an alternate reading for the word our bones. There's another alternate reading in the text which can mean their bones. So he's not talking about David's bones. He's talking about the bones of his opposition. So here's what I think he's saying. I'll go out on a limb. Here's what I think he's saying. In light of all he's been praying about himself, He's, because he's praying about himself, not his op op opponents, correct? And he's saying, God, when, when the day comes that th their judges are like thrown off of cliffs with the, the, the ridiculous nature of how they lived and how they opposed me, when their day comes for reckoning and, and it's like they are all dead and it's all over for them, at the end of the day, might they always have in their mind that David's words were what? What did he say? Pleasant. Now think about this. He's saying, God, as I pray about myself, that I, that I would be a man of prayer, that I would watch my mouth, I would have desires that are honorable, etc. As I think about all those things, when the, those who oppose me finally have their day where you deal with them, might I not gloat over it? But might they have in their mind, as they think about their life and how they treated me, might they not be able to say, well, David was just like we were. No. Might they think, wow, how pleasant were his words to us when we mistreated him. Could this not be your prayer as you look for the new year to say, God, when I am mistreated, which is gonna happen, my response to be back to those who mistreat me, be so full of kindness and compassion, it's gonna be all they're gonna think about later because their day will come. First Peter chapter three, uh, Peter says this. He says to sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil, insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for that very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For let him who means to love life and see good days refrain his tongue, that's the mouth, from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Good advice that David would have said I love. Because that's basically what David's praying. God, might I not ever return evil for evil, insult for insult, but that my, my opponents who are opposed to the faith so see you living in me that they see the kindness and generosity of you just flowing out of me. What does our old world need? People like that, Christians like that. Because we've got plenty of the other, don't we? Lastly, or not lastly, we're on number six. Yeah, get focused on God. He says, for my eyes are toward thee, O God, the Lord, in thee I take refuge. Do not leave me defenseless. He says, God, just help me keep my eyes on you. Because what happens when something terrible has happened to your life as a Christian, it's, it's easy to get your eyes off of God and on your issue. 
and wallow in the problem. And he says, God, help me not do that. Help me just keep my eyes fixed on you because you are my source of defense. Isaiah chapter 45, I've used with many people in tough situations, myself included, where God says this. God says, I am the Lord, there's no other. Beside me, there is no God. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising of the setting of the sun that there is no be God, God besides me. I am the Lord, there is no other, though I am the one who forms light, the good things, and I create darkness, the tough things, causing well-being and ca creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all of these things. In any given situation, you as a Christian have to step back and say, God is the only living God, and he is totally sovereign over my life, over the things that are good, and the things that are tough. He's over all of those things, or he's not God. By definition of him being sovereign, he, he then is there to protect you. He says so in Isaiah 43. Notice what he says. He says, but now thus says the Lord your creator, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel. Don't fear. Don't fear. Why? I redeemed you. And I've called you by name. I know your name. And you're mine. When, not if, when you pass through the waters, the deep water, I'm not gonna desert you. That's what he says. I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they're not gonna overflow you. When you walk through the fire, uh, like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, remember them? Uh, you're, you're not gonna be scorched nor will the flame burn you. Why? Because God says, I'm with you. So the devil whispers in your ear in times of great trial, God has forgotten you. God does not hear you. God doesn't remember your name. And, and David says, no, God, help me to be the kind of man that keeps my eyes focused on you above all things. That might be a great prayer to pray as you look for 2022. And then lastly, he moves uh, from himself to his enemies. Notice what he says in verses nine to 10. He says, you need to keep your eyes peeled, peeled on the lookout. Verse nine, keep me from the jaws of the trap which they have set for me and from the snares of those who do iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I pass by safely. Um, as, as, as the cold began to set in this year, and it hasn't really been cold at all, has it? I feel like I live on the West Coast. It's totally amazing. Uh, but as it's, as we've had moments of cold, uh, mice are coming into my garage. I don't know how they get in. Their bodies must collapse or something to come in the, through the door cracks and stuff. So I had to do what any man would have to do to protect his family. <laughs> no, I don't stand out there and pray, oh God, save my garage. You know, I set traps. I probably have too many traps because I've triggered some of those traps. Did you see the movie Mouse Trap? Yeah. Too many traps is not a good thing, but I've got all kinds too. Cause it's like, I've got the kind they crawl into like a hotel and they can't crawl out. I mean, big ones, little ones, I have all kinds. Uh, wooden ones that are really tricky to set and uh, plastic ones, I, I have all kinds. And they're all around the perimeter, like where they, where I, they typically come in my garage. Uh, I have triggered, I don't even know how many traps. I know where they are. Haven't you ever felt your life is kind of like that? You look at your life and you think, gosh, man, I get up, I go to the Pentagon, I don't have a window, I park out in the middle of nowhere, I get in there, I got my little cubicle, and my whole office feels like a whole bunch of mousetraps. You know, because this person's kind of moody, and I've offended them before, I didn't know how I did it, and this person's at a passive aggressive, and you know what I'm talking about? And you have all this, it's like there's traps everywhere. And then you go home and it's like my husband, he's like a mousetrap, or my wife's like a mousetrap, or my high school kids are like mousetraps. I mean, there's just like mousetraps everywhere. And he says, you know, when you're dealing with situations where the wicked are around you, godless people can be around you, he says, you need to keep your eyes peeled where the traps are. That I am not falling for that passive aggressive stuff, whatever it is. This is what he's saying. God, help me, you know, to see where the traps are that they set before me. Because ungodly people set traps for you. Why? Because your life bothers them. It convicts them. So they want to trap you. Mark 12, notice what they did to Jesus. So they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to him, Jesus, in order to hmm, trap him in a statement. And they came to him and they said, uh, teacher, we, we know that you're truthful and we def and defer to no one. Uh, it, for you're not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. They're buttering them up, are they not? You can smell a rat in this. Uh, is it lawful? We have a question. We have a, a complex question. Is it lawful to pay poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. And they brought him one, and he said to them, whose likeness is on the inscription? And they said to him, uh, Caesar's. Uh, and Jesus said to them, well, 
render to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And then they were all basically blown away. Because what were they trying to do? Did they really want to know, how do you feel about taxation? Because if he says, I am all for Caesar, he's pro-Rome. But if he, he says, I am against taxation, he's against the government. What does Jesus say? You as a Christian are, uh, well, you have two citizenships. You have heavenly and you have an earthly. You give to the earth what they're demanding and you give to God and you thought you were gonna get out of taxes this year. You give to, you give to the government what they're asking for uh, and then you give to God what God asks of you. Is there anything else to argue about? It, no. Uh, and Jesus said, I, I, I just merely saw what they were trying to do to me. That, that whole chapter, by the way, if you read chapter 12, is one constant trying to subvert Jesus. That might be your life, whether it's with your family, people you carpool with, slug with, work with, wherever you're at, whatever base you're at, whatever it is, you might look at this and go, I can totally understand that. Because it feels like there's traps all over the place. Traps with race, gender, sexuality, vax, no vax, mask, no, you see what I'm saying? Now all of a sudden you get it. Are those not all traps? Yeah, you're right, they all are traps. So what should you be praying for? God, give me the wisdom to know what the trap is and then how to speak in such a way that I'm like you and I leave them with nothing else to say. I gave you seven things. Do you remember them? Number one, it's test. It's test time. Number one is prayer. Two, work on your mouth. Three, work on your desires. Four, what was it? Yeah, God sent me to somebody that's godly who will criticize me. Five. What is it? Yes, be pleasant with the unpleasant. Keep your eyes focused on God. And then what was the last one? Give my eyes pill for the traps that, that, that the non-Christians set around me so that I can live in such a way that they can see you. I'd say that's pretty good for 2022, wouldn't you? I think it's good for me. Now it's just to go out and do it. Don't follow me into the grocery store. I'm just saying. <laughs> Let's pray. God, thank you just for opportunity to learn what it means to be a godly person. And it is not simple because our world tries us in many different ways. Might we live in such a way this year that those who don't know you can see you living in us and through us because of how we respond. Thank you for David's otherworldly response to his issues. Might we be like him? and bless us greatly because of that. And may you get the honor and the glory when we live in such a way that people can see the light of the gospel in us. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Happy New Year.